Hello, everybody. My name is Beckwith, Paul Beckwith. And in this short video, I'm going to talk about some of the concerning effects that could happen with an AMOC shutdown. So four point, the 4.2K event is an event 4,200 years ago, roughly um, 2,200 uh, uh, before Common Era. And there was many disruption to many civilizations around the world but due to um, drought um, and wells drying up <clears throat> and just not enough food and water for people um, in, in certain regions of the world. And this 4.2K event is attributed to a shutdown of the AMOC, or at least a serious slowdown of the Atlantic Marinal Overturning Circulation System. So with an AMOC shutdown, there was more heat staying at the equator, less heat going up into the Arctic. The intertropical convergence zone band of storms near the equator, normally near the equator, shifted southward and it missed many regions where there was rainfall before. So these regions that it missed became desert. And this is very concerning because we're seeing one of the biggest droughts that we've seen on record in Iran and major cities like Tehran, for example, are actually cautioning that they may, there, there's been reports, they may actually have to abandon the city while there's 15 million people there. Um, there's, you know, what, 60, 70 million people in Iran. There's many people in Iraq. These regions are becoming drier and drier just in the last few years. And is that drought just a cyclical thing, or is it actually indicative of a um, of a failing AMOC? So that's what I want to talk about. Um, I'll do a separate detailed video on the 4.2K event, but I just want to um, summarize some parts of a post that I came across by Sharon Astick on Facebook. She said... If there's one under-examined news story in the world I'm watching super closely, um, it's a response to Iran's drought. Okay? And I did a video recently on the drought in Iran. More than half of the nation of Iran is facing extreme drought. Most of the water levels in the regions where it is facing the drought are below 3% capacity. They're only 3% of what they would normally be. Now it's about 50 days, almost two months after the start of the rainy season. And there hasn't been a drop of rain in most of the major cities in Iran. More than 150,000 people have already been displaced, many of them farmers, and there's talk of evacuating the city of Tehran, the capital of Tehran. Meanwhile, Iraq, okay, has less than a quarter of the groundwater that it normally has. And agriculture is drying out and being abandoned in some regions. Do you remember back in grade school learning about the cradle of civilization, the first cities that ever existed, about the way that the Tigris River and the Euphrates River shaped our world? and led to the development of modern civilizations. Those regions were marshy. There was lots of water availability and that created the agriculture, the, the advent of agriculture that created, allowed the creation of these cities to occur. So right now there's an increasing number of nations that are damming rivers, right? They're damming what's left of these rivers, trying to create reservoirs uh, so they, they hold enough water for their people. But then, of course, it affects countries that are downstream on those same rivers. So it causes regional conflict. Southern Iraq is no longer the marshy wetland regions um, that, that, that you could have agriculture and human sustenance and natural sustenance on. 
in some places, in some regions, namely Sistan and Belushitstan, the rivers and lakes have dried up almost completely. And with the uh, lack of rainfall, you get extreme heat. Of course, those go hand in hand, extreme heat, lack of rainfall, drought. So extreme heat in the Middle East is now making Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, those of course are oil rich nations that can afford it to pay more, of, more and more of their GDP for desalination projects. So, so they're leading the world in desalination more than anywhere else. Poorer nations just can't afford desalination. Now, there are consequences to desalination, right? The desalination plants are on coastlines. Of course, with sea level rise, they'll be negatively affected. But in the process of desalination, taking the salt out of ocean water to create drinking water, the salt has to go somewhere, right? The salt is usually just dumped back into the ocean, which, is, is, which has to make the plant <laughs> work even harder to desalinate, right? It would raise the salinity instead of being three and a half percent or 35 PSU on those coastlines, you know, it can climb five, 10, you know, be five, 10% instead of three and a half percent salt. So the, the water is brackish. It's highly salty. Almost nothing can live in it. So it destroys the fish, fish stocks in, in the Gulf. Saudi Arabia uses about 300,000 barrels of oil per day just to create fresh water to run these desalination plants. And temperatures there, uh, even at night, rarely fall below 34 Celsius in the summer. So it's getting tremendously hot. I mean, these regions are becoming the hottest regions in the world. For many years, people grew wheat and rice in the Gulf, irrigating heavily to make these crops, olives, dates, palms, pomegranates, and other traditional tree crops cannot be irrigated and are dying, basically. There's not enough water in many places to even irrigate the traditional crops that do better in the heat and drought. Iran was the first country to repeatedly hit temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius. Imagine that. The extreme heat and drought mean that agriculture is largely impossible in many parts of the nation now. So there's talk, um, you know, and in, so in Iran, yeah, there's talk of evacuating the entire city of Tehran. They'd have to move them up closer to the coastline where there is at least some rainfall. Since water is inconsistent at best in the poorer parts of the city, the reservoirs are headed to zero, you know, day zero event. No water left, taps run dry. Um, they're recently doing cloud seeding in Iran to try to change the situation. Let's look at uh, Egypt. Egypt is also heading to absolute scarcity of water. At the, by the end of this year, there's expected to be only 500 cubic meters of water per person for the entire country, for everyone, even with the Nile River, access to the Nile River. That's hard to imagine since the Nile River is literally being the blood circulatory system flowing through Egypt. It's the lifeblood of Egypt. It's why the cities are in Egypt to where they are. Just look at a map of the Nile and where all the cities in Egypt are located. So not enough fresh water in the Nile. Egypt and many of the coastal Gulf states also have a huge salin salinization problem because rising sea levels are con contaminating soils and fresh water with salt. And often the coastal regions have the most best agriculture um, traditionally, uh, but not when the sea water inundates them and, and uh, destroys the soils, fills them with salt. 40% of Egyptian cropland, that's 40% of the agriculture in Egypt is affected by salt contamination. Much of the salt will have to be removed in order to make agriculture viable again in those regions. Rice cultivation is banned in Egypt now. Wheat turns yellow and dies due to the excess salt in the soils. Turkey, which just got the COP for next year, COP 31. It was just announced. Australia relinquished their bid. People were saying Australia wasn't serious because the PM of Australia has never been to a COP. 
and wasn't at this one either. So if, if they wanted the cop, and also, you know, there are a lot of climate deniers in Australia to keep their coal industry running. So anyway, Turkey got the COP, COP31. Now in Turkey, the, it's, it, the same thing's happening to sunflower crops. And in Thrace, the largest sunflower oil region, yields are down by more than 50%. Turkish rainfall is down by 39%. And the dams, the reservoirs behind the dams are so low that in some tourist regions of Turkey, the water has to be shut down during the daytime. Okay, it's that bad. Every single assessment of climate change indicates that the Middle East and North Africa will be one of the worst affected regions in any climate scenarios. They're, particularly, they're in particularly dire straits if in fact the AMOC decline or shutdown continues to progress, which, well, it is progressing. So this is where we come to the 4.2 kilo year event, the 4.2, 4,200 years ago. There was more than 100 years of extreme drought in the Middle East region. It brought down multiple empires that, that are, and they're all linked to the AMOC decline. So the empires like, and I'll talk about this in more detail, the 4.2K event very soon in another video, but it's the, in the epic of Gilgamesh, there's a character lamenting, we have reduced the forest to wasteland. There's something called the Curse of Akkad, which was written 500 laters after the epic of Gilgamesh. And in the Curse of Akkad, there's talk of a mega drought in which the great agricultural tracts produced no grain. So we're only at 5.5 over historic norms. But there's already many states in the Middle East that are reaching wet bulb temperatures or seeing untenable, unlivable drought. The two potential futures are expanding and accelerating climate change that bring us to well over three degrees Celsius quite rapidly, or even worse, you know, that's just climate as usual, or even worse, in an AMOC shutdown, that will increase <coughs> the heating in the Middle East and the drought, and it'll shift the rainfall away. And there's going to be catastrophic consequences. So right now, we're largely tracking the IPCC's worst-case scenarios. There's no major plan in sight to keep us below 3 Celsius by, you know, say, 2050. Right? That's only a couple decades away, two and a half decades. By the time today's children are adults, the odds are very good that most of the region in the Middle East will be inhabitable only by the wealthy who, who can run the desalination plants and a much smaller percentage of poor people who serve the wealthy. So it's only the wealthy can afford minor major climate mitigations and import food um, in extreme climate disasters from other regions. So we're coming up with the blunt truth. The blunt truth is that the land everyone is currently fighting over is for extractive purposes minerals, oil, natural gas, is likely to be largely uninhabitable within decades. And that isn't a today is fine and tomorrow everybody leaves process. It's a process of drought, floods, extreme heat events, crop failures, hunger, extraction, disaster capitalism, water wars and violence, and we're all completely unprepared for what's coming. We know that some tiny countries facing extreme sea level rise are making plans for evacuation, but Iran has a population of, there you go, 86 million people. The region, um, the region, the whole region surrounding that area is 500 million people. That's, uh, you know, that's 1 16th of global population. Everybody will not leave, nor will every nation be affected in the same ways. But by, you know, in the next, by two, three decades, four decades, the population is going to be probably halved in that region, at least by AMOC shutdown or drop by a 25% if the AMOC stays together and just climate change proceeds. So the politics of water, food, and life in the Middle East will get stunningly worse in a place that's all, all, also already deeply fraught by conflict. So that brings us back to Tehran. 
if 15 million Iranians in, in the Tehran area have to evacuate, where do they go with more than half the country in extreme drought? What incentives does that give their government to either create or resist conflict? How does that change the entire picture, picture of the whole region and the world order, right? And the answer is that nobody really knows that question. Okay, so this is very serious stuff that's, that's happening today, now, and will play out over the next few decades. Thank you for listening. Please go to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donate to support my research and videos. Thanks again, and bye for now.